Okay, recording is in progress. All right, so let's discuss um, like the final the document that I made. Um, I should use the iPad because that controls it. <laughs> so we I made this for the midterm. So this page sort of has like some notations in case that, you know, because for the midterm that might have tripped us up. Uh, these notations do change um, since we've learned some new. Oh, uh, Gia, you're muted right now. Okay, so I have made little adjustments and apparently. <laughs> All right, cool. So I have to say that again. <laughs> okay. So here's the document that I made for the, the final. Um, so the first few pages basically cover the things that um, from the midterm. And I put in some notation. And we start off with like ANOVA one way for the balance design. If you were not here for my midterm prep, then you may notice that um, this might be new to you the one way and over for the unbalanced design. And this is actually the formula you would have needed to use for question two on the midterm, uh, which, you know, kind of that kind of threw us for a loop because we weren't ex expecting it. But then Erica had a section where we practiced this. So that's where I had this information. Um, generally, I think the most important thing about an unbalanced design that you should know is the Y bar dot dot. Um, because you have to account for the weights of each of the different observations when you average these things out. Um, also to note for the unbalanced design, you will have a different formula for Tukey as well as LSD, namely that inside the square root right here, where you are working with the NIs and the NJs, um, those will change, those will be different than this portion right here. Okay, um, another thing is that you'll see here in red, this changes from one way. I'm gonna use this opportunity to say that a lot of the times um, for all F tests, we should all know that, you know, just have to worry about the fact that um, the second degree of freedom, the V2, which is your denominator, that is going to be, it's associated with your degree of freedom of your error. And that reason for that is because um, you think an F distribution is basically a chi-square distribution on top of another chi-square distribution, and the denominator is the error. Um, the, the error is a, is a chi-square distribution. All right. So- Thank you. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Is that possible? Oh, oh thank okay. you. <laughs> yeah. Check that out. You spin it. <laughs> All right. Also, I think um, Karan and Ryan are in the waiting room. Okay. Why don't we admit them? And let me look at the participants. I think there was just Karan. I didn't see Ryan in here. Uh, I think it's the extended group that he'll be joining shortly. Hi, Karan. Hi, sorry. What's... Okay, I'm going to mute him for a second. <laughs> and you said Ryan was here? But I don't see him yet. He texted in yeah. my group that he'll join shortly or something. Okay. Well, we're just doing the beginning portion right now. Um, okay. So. 
Okay, so for the, <clears throat> I added a few things to the balanced and complete plot design notes, namely where you can find the lecture and the homework, where you can find an example in the homework, as well as where Dr. J talked about it in lecture 10. Um, and also Shervan was nice enough to make these nice tables as also a quick reference. So you don't have to flip back and forth between your lecture notes or your textbook. And conveniently, there's also a little bit of notation here so that you can quickly reference how to get your formula. Um, so since our TA, as well as Dr. J, strongly hinted that the BIBD design is going to be on the final, it you know, is one of the things that we should be practicing in preparation. And the extra time that it would take to complete this table versus say like a regular one way or, you know, two way an over table is mainly because of your QI vector, which you then have to square independently. Like, so you have to square each individual QI value. Um, so let's see here. It's likely that since we were, are going to have a BIBD design work with, we will probably be asked to check the model. And then what else to note? Okay, let's see. Does anybody have any like questions, by the way, about anything up until the midterm or want to discuss anything? Um, I think there might have been an error with the uh, BIBD ANOVA table. Mm -hmm. The uh, I, I sent you a homework problem earlier in the textbook, and I wasn't able to get the correct answer with uh, the SS of treatment formula that's on there. Uh, instead of it being divided by lambda, K, and T, uh, it was uh, multiplied with K divided by lambda and T. So the K should be in the numerator. I just wanted to confirm to make sure that was correct. Um, yeah, that's because I believe it. here. I wasn't able to get the right answer until I made that adjustment. Um, so I was kind of surprised. And if that's the case, then we definitely have to. Yes. There He's on is. top. Yep. K yep. Is okay. Here. All right, so I will note that in the document so that we can go ahead and I will say. All right, cool, good catch. Thank you. No, oh, of course. All right. So let's see, what do we want to discuss about this? So yeah, okay. So basically the QIs take a little bit of time, but they're really easy. Um, just to explain that a little bit. Does anybody have any questions about QI, how to find it? Or better yet, can someone tell me how to find it? Um, take the treatment sum, multiply it by K. And oh. is that right? Subtract. Oh. Um, here, I'll, um, I'll try writing the formula in Actually, maybe I can just show you guys. Is my camera reversed or one second? Why don't, why don't I, um, I was hoping that somebody would explain it to me as if I were like a five-year-old, right? And that way we could like think through like when you're faced with this question, how we would go about solving it, right? And the easiest way for me to explain how I approach this problem is to say that I look at basically all of, you know, Here's, here's my data, all right? And the first thing I would do, I guess, is either find the sum totals, um, like 
I would either find the grand total, or in this case, I actually started out with row totals. And QIs, I's are associated with rows, right? And J's are associated with columns. So that's kind of how I try to remember which total is relevant first. So my first step in this problem ended up being, hey, I, for row one, which is hardwood concentration two, I add up every value in this row, 114 plus 120 plus 117, and that gives me my row totals. Once I get my vector of row totals, then I go ahead and I find my column totals, which would be for day one, it would be these three values, day two, these three values, and so forth. Now to find my QI vector, I take my row total, and that is what I, that's, that's, that's why I say, you know, QI associated with row total. And so I say, okay, my row total subtracts the sum of the column totals that are relevant and associated with my row total. In plainer words, what I'm saying is, is that if I have my row total, 114, 120, 117, you notice that I color coded them pink. The reason being is I say, oh, for hardwood concentration one, we had this test on day one, day five, and day seven. Then I go to my column totals. Day one is 381. Day five is 381. And day seven is 378, which is why I am adding 381 plus 381 plus 378. Then I divide that by the number of observations for that particular association between hardwood concentration and day. And that's kind of like the simplest way I like to remember it because once I start looking at the summations and like trying to remember the relevant notation, it kind of costs some time. So practically I get my vector of QI, then I square each value to get my QI squared. Negative 29 squared, 841. Once I have my QI squared vector, then I can sum it all up, this plus this plus this, so on, and I get 3,074. So now I'm set up to be able to find my SS treatment. Well, I guess we could have calculated this first since I'm supposed to check the model. So perhaps the first thing to do in a BIBD is to do the, hey, check if this model is valid. Um, can we go over what are the two conditions? Checking model. Sure. Um, yeah, before we do, could we, uh, I think Jerry's in the waiting room right now. Oops. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you for letting me know. Oh, well, there's, there were quite a few people in the waiting room. Uh, um, um, interesting. I think I've admitted all of them. Are there any more? Okay. Um, I, I only knew because I checked the group chat right now. I admitted them though, didn't I? Yeah, I think so. Hello. Hi everyone. You haven't missed Hello. anything so far. Um, I'm also recording this session and so far all I've done is covered up to BIBD. So we're in pretty good shape. Um, if you need a review on everything up to the midterm, then we can uh, watch the recording and I'll upload it into YouTube after, after I'm done. Cool. Okay. Oh, uh, the two conditions? Yes. So we, I asked um, to, for the two conditions to check for model validity, which was, I think on the midterm as like the final question or or it wasn't. Either way. I think it was um, homework for the yeah, that's it. last question. Yeah. Um, the two conditions are B times K must be equal to R times T. Mm -hmm. And the second one is um, finding the value of lambda and making sure that that is a whole number using the formula lambda is equal to R times the quantity of K minus one all over T minus one. And if lambda is not a whole number, then you cannot do BIBD. Perfect. Okay. So we had just gone over how we calculate 
SS treatment, which is this equation right here. And, you know, going briefly over how to find your QI vector um, so that you can square it, multiply it by K and divide it by lambda T. In this case, our lambda, you know, lambda was one. So we ended up with that value here, three times three zero seven four divided by 1.7. And then we subtracted our CF. Okay, going back to our final quick reference. Okay, so that's very nice. Um, I did put like the degrees of freedom in there just in case um, it could be useful perhaps. Um, there is also a little bit of like explanation here. Um, and then does anybody have any questions in particular about the BIBD design? Actually, will, will we have to know how to estimate the parameters of that or no? Um, gosh, you know, intuitively, I would be surprised because it's such an involved problem, but yeah, we could potentially need to know how to estimate the parameters. Um, but I don't recall seeing a whole lot in the textbook about that, even though I wanted I've to- I've seen it in the textbook. I just haven't seen it in the class notes. So I don't think if he hasn't gone over it, then we aren't responsible for it, correct? That is what he has repeatedly said, but also, you know, <laughs> who knows? Like he next, he didn't exactly like talk a whole lot about the unbalanced design that showed up on the midterm. Right. So, um, I will go ahead and look for it again, but I combed the textbook and when I was looking for things and I don't really think I saw this necessarily. Um, okay. I'd have to think about it, but it's also possible that we could estimate this um, in the same manner that we would have done the RBD design. Like okay. it's possible, I'd have to think about it and like try it out, which I haven't the time for at the moment. But I'll write a note to myself to see if I can find it and then include it. Okay, so Latin square design. I like this one, but it also takes a long time. Um, here we have Trevin's nicely handwritten. I'm so jealous of his handwriting. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and he's nice enough to like write the hypotheses. Everything looks really good. And I think, yeah, the thing to be careful, I think the one thing like I might forget if I didn't like highlight it or something is like the T minus <laughs> two. That's a little tricky. Um, and yeah. I put some, yes, the hypotheses as well. The replicated one, this was from homework four. This is the one where you have your table and you do the experiment again, and then you have to keep track of, you know, adding up all of the A's and all of the B's from both tables and incorporating that. The only difference in the notation for the replicated Latin square appears to be the little n. And I remember during our study session yesterday, I was like, hey, I can't remember. Does the little n ever change its meaning other than like the number of observations? And we thought, no, but actually, yes, little n in the replicated Latin square designates the number of replications that we're working with. Um, based on time constraints, I would say it's unlikely we would see an n greater than two, but if they're going to just give us like, hey, you know, um, y bar dot, a or whatever, I don't know if I've ever used that notation, but if we're saying like, hey, for the A, you know, this A total would be, 
you know, some number, then yeah, it's possible we might have to have to work with that. I'm a little concerned about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, has anybody done like any of the examples for that one? That. I'll be doing um, them later tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I was just doing the 4.3 one, just trying to see if I have some, mm -hmm. I didn't by myself. It kind of worked out, but I knew, I knew the answer, of course. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing, like when you're faced, you know, when you're faced with like the word problem, they usually just give you this portion of the table and Sometimes like I just like to kind of just start jumping right into the row totals and the column column totals. It gives me something to do while I plan like my next move <laughs> face with the problem. And it also is something that I'm going to eventually need. So it's kind of like for me, I have anxiety. So I end up just like, OK, just total up the rows, total up the columns. And at least while I do that, I can kind of manage my anxiety and still get the information I need without wasting time. Um, I also like to write down, you know, my values, especially because we're using these formulas. Um, I like to write down my P and then how many I have in total, five. Latin squares are always balanced. So you just, and I guess, you know, some people might say like, hey, this is T. You, you kind of have to get used to what notation you're using. I believe that in my document here, I believe I put that um, for Latin squares. No, I did not. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I think it's nice to get like the total. You just add up everything and then find your CF. After that, you have to go through this process. So since we are allowed to use Excel and Desmos, um, it's kind of a nice way to add up everything and check your values before, you know, rather than doing it twice. Um, save some time you can see all your values in like a row and then just go through them and check them real quick um here i put 64 because i just squared everything in my head and then i added them up um any questions on this part anything tricky that i see so for the treatment um for the ss rows so basically these are gonna be, again, your row total squared over your T, and T equals five, which apparently I wrote as P and then I changed my notation. <laughs> and columns, pretty easy. It's the same thing you did for Y, I dot. Instead you're using your column totals, squaring that, dividing it by the number T, be five. Okay, and then, oh, that's right, we have treatments as well. So we have the T to the T sub K squared. Um, so here we have, let's see, A, B, C, D, E. Oh, that's right, this is where we add up these. So I notated it as Y dot A, y dot b, y dot c dot. And that means that you have to go back up to your table and add up all your a's, a's. So eight plus nine plus seven plus eight plus 10. And that would give you 42. Square that, do the same thing for your b's, c's, d's, and e's. Don't forget to subtract the cf. And you divide all of that by t. And then the error by subtraction and your hypotheses.
Um, and that's kind of it for that. Um, what else is important? Does anybody have any questions while I think about what else I can include or say? Was that last part, was that just like adding the row totals and all that? Uh, the part that you just showed us, like the a, y dot a dot oh. squared, that's the row? No. Not the column. That is neither. So oh. in the Latin square design, let me zoom out just a little bit. You have SS rows, SS columns, but you also have SS treatment. And in the Latin square design, oh. your treatment is denoted by the letters A, B, C, D, E, or F, or however oh. many that there are. Um, so what that means is you have to go back and you have to add up all your A's. Oh, oh, that's the, like the pink ones is like the A's, and like maybe the purple ones, like the B or whatever. Okay, it sounds good. Thank you. Exactly. And it might be helpful if you don't like color code just to like have a separate table where you write your A values and your B values. Um, that's probably a good way not to make an error. Um, and then in the replications version, let's scroll down to that one. Here we go. So you kind of do the same thing as you would for the regular Latin squares, but this time we have to, when you do your y dot a, you would actually be like adding all of them together. So, yeah, so I just basically used it from the top one. I found, I did the same thing again, just for the second table. And I just found this from 4.25 from the problem above. Um, and then that's when your n value is the number of replications. So our t was five, so it's five times two. Oh, I'm sorry, our t was four. Hmm. T was four. Oh, because this is a different, okay, four by four Latin square. So yes, our t is four. We multiply it to two. Um, does anybody have any questions about this one? I have a question about like two keys and Fisher LST. Oh, for or LRP, Latin squares? Yeah, like, you know how we can do that for treatment? Mm -hmm. Do we ever do it for the blocks or the... Um, like the letters? Mm, I think the letters are the treatments, unless I'm wrong. <laughs> Someone okay, do, do we ever do it for like anything other than the treatment for any of these? You know, I don't think we went over that in class, but here's my understanding of when we even do those tests. It's when we find something to be significantly affecting our model. So if, it's possible, like I can't see why you wouldn't. I mean, since you're interested in the treatments, I would say you probably wouldn't need to test. Like if you were a company and you were saying, hey, I've got these five different solutions and it can make our product better. Um, and if your test found that none of those solutions actually improve upon your product, then you would be kind of wasting money to like check and see anything else. But if you know if if nothing was significantly affecting the yield but um i don't know maybe there is a situation and let's say your treatment effects were not significant but you tested your row effects like your your days or whatever your row was like whatever that indicated here it's the order um and you found that to be significant then yeah maybe you would want to test which one is the most significant so you can find out what's happening on that day or order or whatever and then change it so i guess yeah you could and if you did do that then i would imagine that it would follow the same rule and you would just change um the the numerator portion of your test to accommodate you know the value i, I forget what it is 
let me take a look on the quick reference that Meredith, did you ever find the um, the two key for the Latin square? Yeah, I sent a picture. Uh, Erica sent it to me. Okay, I don't think I included it. Oh, yeah, mine just has my my latest from you just says ask Erica. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I sent the picture in the the group chat. Okay. Just from my email. Okay. Add. I so, can send that picture. I can actually just forward that email to you. Okay. So for those of you who just joined us, clearly this document is a work in progress. There were some errors that we need to fix, but that's what everybody's here for is to like work on, you know, making this nice and tight so we can all use it tomorrow and get a really nice score. So, all right. So, but it does seem like, let's just talk a little bit about these tests, right? So my understanding is that for like, say the, I'll start with Fisher since I'm more confident about this one. So for the Fisher LSD, we're basically, you know, taking our alpha of choice and dividing it by two. The reason we divide the T distribution by two is because it's symmetrical. So when we want a confidence level or when we want um, like, a, a confidence, we have to divide it by two because it's symmetrical, it could be on either side. Whereas I think for the Qs, I don't know that it's symmetrical. I actually don't know what that distribution looks like. But for an F distribution, we always just use regular alpha. And that's because the F distribution has like that. And we are only interested in like maybe that or that or something. Um, so for at least the LSD, this portion, this parameter is always associated with your error degrees of freedom. Okay. So if you've been doing your Fisher LSD comparison for any particular design and you don't have it in your notes, you're like, I don't know how to do the Fisher LSD for this pair of means that I would like to test in the two factor then you just basically have to pick your alpha. Usually it's gonna be 0 0.05. And this parameter here, that's just gonna be your degrees of freedom, error, de error degrees of freedom. And since almost everything else other than that unbalanced ANOVA, you can just use this one. And this is just your error DF. And that's going to be your generalized um, statistic or critical value or for the Fisher LSD. And for Tukey, Tukey has, has, been, um, has been interesting. Like for here, here's one that we should really pay attention to. For the two factor design, we've got our Q alpha. We're not worried about our alpha. We're worried about this here and this here because they're going to be the opposite. So if you are looking for, if you are testing for your B, then you're gonna be using A, the other factor that is involved. So two factors, you have factor A, factor B. So if you are testing for B, you are going to use A. And if you are testing for A, you are going to use B. All right. That is what it, that's kind of what it, what it is. So this is maybe not completely accurate. And that is if you are, yeah, doing a two-factor design. Okay. What else? Um, so if you're testing for B, you'll use A as the first one, or is it the opposite? So if you're testing for B here, right? Like if, if you're doing, let's see, I would like an example so I could actually talk about it. Um, and let's go back to two factor. Did we ever do a two factor problem that required two key in our homework? 
I can come with right now. Yeah. I have them up. Here's our two factor. Come on, be there. Come on, be there. Let's point estimates and p values. We have confidence intervals. <laughs> yeah. Their confidence interval is going to solve two key. Okay, so I will actually look in the textbook then. One second. All right. Textbook here. And that was in chapter five. Sorry about the scrolling. Don't get motion sickness. Too far, too far. There we go. Two factor factorial design. Here we go. All right. Okay, we're getting close. We're getting close. Yeah, you need to get Roman out inside. Okay, I'm. I will in a minute. So, Roman, stop. Shoot, where was it? I just saw it a little while ago. Oh my gosh, this goes on forever. 5.6. Yeah, I don't know, I can't find it. But it's switched. It's, it is definitely when you're looking at, like let's say you found something to be significant, like let's say you found factor B to be significant. So if you're gonna do a test then you do a and then if it's a you do b but i can't verify that because i can't find it in the textbook again <laughs> so i don't know somebody else might have to and if i find it i'll include it where i found it so you said sorry um you said if it's a you do yes. b yeah so if you're testing for like a then you would do b here and if you're doing b you do a here but Okay. I'm going to verify that once I find it, because I was studying this earlier when I was putting this together. And then I was like, oh, OK, that's how you do it. But then now I can't seem to find it again. So. And then the, um, the A or B in the denominator of that root will be opposite. Right here. Of whatever. Right. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. But I'm not sure yet. So just hold that thought. That's one of the things I'm going to leave red on this just to be absolutely sure. Definitely recall reading that. Okay. Next up, what's the next thing after Latin squares? Oh, we just did Latin squares. We did two factor design. So Shravan asked, uh, like, talked about. Um, a really good point. Like, how are we going to recognize the difference between a two factor or a three factor versus a two to the two versus a two to the three factorial? And so we were like thinking about how we could answer that. And one of the things that Erica hinted at was that we may be given 
like a problem and then having to identify what type of design that is. And like going back to like the homework, you know, if you're, I don't think I have like a copy of it, but like if you're given like a word problem, right? Actually, I wonder if I, I should interrupt, but Han's in the waiting room again. Oh, thank you. So like, if you have like a word problem, right? And suppose you only get shown this part <laughs> and they just give you like the row totals, like what if they go y dot a is equal to some number, you know? And then you have to determine like what design that is. Like, let's say all this was not shown. Like that's kind of what they wanted us to practice. I guess this particular one that I just randomly circled happens to be a Latin square design because we have, oh, there are effective five different ingredients. So we see that our treatment has, you know, been categorized as A, B, C, D, E. Like that's a really quick giveaway. But if you consider say a problem, which I don't think I have here of like, um, of the homework problem in five, where we had a three factor design. And I believe that one involved say like the number of, they were testing a booster in a laundry detergent. And what they were doing was, does the booster have any significant effect on the yield? And the options were yes and no. And they were testing it um, with the number of washings as well as, uh, what was the other part of that, Shravan? I think one of it was a new formula and then one of them was an original formula. Yeah, that's right. So if you're using a booster with the original formula of detergent, does it have an effect on the yield? And if you're using it with the old formula, does it have an effect on the yield? But they also thought, well, maybe however many times you use it also makes a difference. So the way we decided we would call it is that it was nested. I don't think they gave us what to call this concept, but it was basically you're just testing booster yes and no against original and new formula with number of washings one, and then the same parameters, but this time under two washings. And so when you see that factors are being tested within two, like within more factors, then you can kind of say, oh, well, I know that that's a three factor design versus say two to the three K, like two to the K design where K equals three, that the two to the three factorial design, that's going to be saying, oh, well, you have um, three factors that you were testing each with two levels. Does everybody kind of see the distinction there? So I asked this to a couple people earlier, but um, does anybody want to take a guess at what two means in two to the K and what K means in two to the K? Like, just so we know that everybody knows what that means. New? I think two is the number of like replications. Are there replications in factorial? It's close, but in a two to the K design, um, well, what, does anybody want to try guessing what K is? Okay, I'll just say it. So a two to the K, um, so the number two, that indicates how I many levels. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Can K be the number of variables? Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, cool. Yeah, number of variables and number of factors. So each factor, there's going to be three factors in a two to the three factorial design, where there are three factors, and each of them have two levels, high or low, which, you know, I don't know. I don't know if yes and no, like an indicator function could also factor into that. But basically, I wrote this in my final document here. So this portion sort of talks about that. 
why we have a two to the k factorial design. Let's go ahead and take a look and, and briefly read through that. Cool. Oh, and before I go any further, did anybody want to discuss three factor ANOVA any further or like talk about any, the homework example or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Also, did anybody manage to get this part? Isn't the there were like two tables for the plus minus for two by three factor in a while that he gave us. It was assigned a textbook actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like the a one, one part was like a, where in two by three, it was like plus, plus, plus. And the other one was like, there were like two homework problems like that actually. Or maybe a one practice problem maybe that Erica gave me, I don't know. Uh, it was in the textbook though. There were like two different kind of problems. I forgot that. But yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, okay, so the two factor and the three factor ANOVA does, or the two factor, three factor designs are also technically called factorial designs in the textbook. And we also have them referred to as multiple comparison as well. Um, or was it multiple comparison designs? Um, but I think in practice, when we are actually working through the problems, they don't seem to like, at least, although in theory, they use the levels as well. We don't, when we calculate our analysis, we don't actually have to worry about the pluses and minuses in the two factor and three factor design. Got it. That's what I want to about. Sorry, you were cutting out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Wi-Fi is bad here, but yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Like, if they connected or now, because I saw that in the book yesterday or the day before yesterday. Okay. So, the two to the k factorial designs, we rely pretty heavily on those pluses and minuses to estimate the effect and to also determine like contrast, et cetera, et cetera. But I was gonna move on to that, but I kind of like lost over two factor and three factor. I think I got like sidetracked by squirrel. So I was like, ah, do we wanna discuss any more of this? Um, or like look at a homework problem or something and talk about homework. Five, I believe, or are we good? I think, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. You go first. Oh, okay. Um, I was just gonna say, I think I'm good on like the ANOVA table for these, but like um, more confused about estimating parameters. Okay. Things, and like uh, Tukey's and Fisher's. And also like confidence interval. Okay. So but if Ryan wants to go over more of these, like, like a homework problem, we should. No, that, that looks good. I was just gonna say going over like a practice problem would be good. It doesn't have to be, I'm not needing it to be on any specific concept. Okay. Why don't we start with that real quick? I'm just gonna go and use my homework problem to talk about it because that's the most readily available. So let's start there. Um, I know we did like confidence interval for some of these. So we don't need that one. Don't need that one. Okay, here's a two factor. Um, so I guess I'll just briefly walk through it. Again, totals are kind of important. And then we have subtotals in our two factor and our three factor. So that is to say we have our like, we have like, actually this is sort of like a subtotal just for my own sake, but like here we might, 
but actually that's actually more relevant for the three factor. That's right. The subtotals are not really as important in the two factor ones when you're calculating at least the analyses. Um, let's go to this time, this part. Oh, also one thing to also kind of pay attention to is note that your between is your subtotal and that it's just going to equal this plus this plus this, A plus B plus AB. And then your within is going to be your error and they're interexchangeable. If you are not in Erica's section, you may not know this, but we do not know which notation language terminology they are going to use tomorrow. So if it might be kind of good to like take note of that part. Um, and let's see your subtotal and your plus your within is going to give you your total degrees of freedom. And just like little things, if you're not in Erica's section. And okay. Ryan, did you want to like talk about how we get our actual values or just like are you good up to then up to now? I'm good. Okay. And then you do your hypotheses, your point estimates at each feed rate. I actually don't know what this is. I forget what this is. Oh, I, I, I see. For each treatment, you're sort of just getting like a hat value, like an estimated mean or something. Okay. Um, find the p value. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I think we were talking about yesterday the p value thing that we did at the beginning of the quarter. Probably mm -hmm. might have started. How to do that? So okay. If we can go over. Yeah. So, he, so the p values are pretty easy. Um, it's you go to your your ANOVA table, and once you've calculated your f, right? You can, since we won't be able to use R or any sort of calculator that tells us the prob like the probability value associated with it of um, you can take your f value and you know how you have like when you go to the tables at the back of your book your table appendix and you look for your f tables and you have multiple f tables you have one for alpha equals 0 0.1 alpha equals 0 0.025 alpha equals 0 0.05 like you have those multiple tables correct mm -hmm. okay so when you look at your F here, this is going to be your uh, MSA over MS error. And there's like, that's why, and there's degrees of freedom because MS is actually just SS over DF. So you have on your numerator, a degree of freedom of two. And in your denominator, you have a degree of freedom of 24. So that means this is going to be your V1 value, and this is going to be your V2 value on your F table. So you have your like five or six F tables. So you, for each one, go down. Let me show you right here. This is Q tables. Here, F table. So for that particular one, I would say, okay, my V1 is two and my V2 is 24, it was 24, right? And then I would go down and I would find that the value is like 5.61. Okay, well, I just arbitrarily start at F 0 0.01. That seems like, you know, let's just go over to the next one. Let's go to F alpha equals 0 0.025. Again, I find two and then I find 24. And I see that it's 4.32. Well, apparently I have to go in the opposite direction, but now I kind of realize that my p value bound 0 0.01, it's not really going to give me anything more. That's about the smallest. So I would just say my p value is less than 0 0.01 because it decreases as your alpha gets bigger. This value decreases as your alpha gets 
bigger. So you need your alpha to go smaller, but you don't have an F table that is smaller than 0 0.01. So that would be it. Now say, say instead of like 50 or whatever that value was, let's say you had a value of uh, four, okay? For the same degrees of freedom then you would see that, well, at, at alpha equals 0 0.01, it's 5.61. And here, alpha equals 0 0.025, it's 4.32. So let's look at the next one. Let's look at alpha equals 0 0.05. This is two, this is 24, and it's 3.40. So, okay, well, four is between 3.40 and 4.32, therefore my p-value bounds would be between 0 0.025 and 0 0.05. Does that make sense? All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Back to this part. Um, we were looking at homework for a second. That's right. Sorry guys, squirrel. Um, so, all right. Okay, confidence intervals. At least I have that. <laughs> um, okay. So for the data in 5.8, we wanna create a 95% confidence interval for the estimate of the mean difference in response for the feed rates of 0 0.20 and 0 0.25. We're gonna go back up to 5.8 table up here. And I'm gonna find where I found those point estimates. Didn't I see it? Oh, point estimates, there we go. Okay, so here are my point estimates for 0 0.020 and 0 0.25. And all that is is their mean estimates. So going back up to my table, that's this and this divided by the number of observations in each. So I see one, two, three times one, two, three, four. That gives me 12. I divide this number by 12 and that's gonna give me my point estimate for its average, which is 81.5833. So then I'm gonna compare these two means, 81 and 97. And in order to do that, you just say mean mu one minus mu two, uh, which is this portion right here. And you use this right here. And again, um, you're, since it's a confidence interval, you're doing alpha over two. And you're also using the degree of freedom for your error. And we can verify that in our ANOVA table Again, it's AB times N minus one. All right. And since this is a balanced design, or I think it's a balanced design, yeah. No, it's not. Hmm. Okay, I just learned something new. So there is no reason to worry about balanced or unbalanced, even though, no, 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 it's balanced. I lied, I lied. <laughs> Each of these have the same number of observations. So n equals 12, n equals 12, n equals 12. All right, so it's balanced and that's why we use that, I guess. So here. Um, and then that's it. You just have this, um, this here. Sorry, it's so messy. I feel really bad about that. So mu one minus mu two plus or minus these guys. Mu one minus mu two minus this is your lower bound. Mu one minus mu two plus this is your upper bound. Sorry, that was all over the place. Any questions?
So by that logic, I think we could also do it for a three factor ANOVA the same way. I don't see why any of this would change. You know, this is actually the same thing we're using for a balanced one way design. The only thing that has changed is our degree of freedom for the error. I had an off uh, unrelated question. How do you know what little n is for two factor and three factor design? Well, I mean, I don't know if I have to, I don't know if I could prove it to you because I can't be absolutely sure that it has it in the textbook, but so far, in all of our designs that we were looking at, the hold on a second, the um, the little n has stayed pretty consistent until you got to the replicated Latin squares. So little n is always like the number of observations you had within a given factor or treatment, right? The only time n was like different, little n, lowercase n was different, was in a replicated Latin square. So your little n is the number of observations? Mm -hmm. Inside a given factor. That is to say, we're talking uh -huh. about 5.8. So we are saying, hey, here, little n, I mean, I guess little n could be three. It depends on like, how it was calculated. So, oh yeah, yeah, it is. So little n in this case is three. Sorry, it's not 12. I am lying. How do you know it's three? That's the part yes. I'm... Okay. Because within a, a two factor and within a three factor, we have, let me see if I can grab a highlighter here. We have this guy. We have, that's a feed rate. That's one of my feed rates. And then we have one of my depth of cuts. And I am choosing to say, this is my cell. Like all of this is my cell. Okay. And then in my cell, I have three observations per cell. So in effect, okay. it's, it's, it's yeah. within the cell. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where that I makes more sense. <laughs> uh, <it's> that's... <laughs> and that's the same in the screen factor design as well where you have like a cell. And here in my three factor ANOVA, my little n equals two because I have, yeah. In my cell, which is this and this, and this and this, and then these are nested in two separate other factors. I right. hate this one because I had to have all these like subtotals and then I had to have like two separate tables. Anyway, um, if we did do like a confidence interval for this, it would follow the same thing as before. And we would only like, let's see, we would do it for maybe H1, H3, and H5 because these are significantly different. So this would probably be a great problem to practice your Tukey on. That was uh, 5.8. 5 okay. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for 5.28. In my head, here's how I would do it for um, Dookie, I would say, I go down to my ANOVA table. And I, I think I said what it was um, treatment H1, treat like this one, right? Did I say that just now? We rejected H1 and we rejected H3. So I would probably want to do um, the Tukey test for those. And I think that my numerator would just basically be, 
the degrees of freedom of all of the ones that I was doing. So if I was just, if, if it was just like A and C, I would probably have to do, to do a degree of freedom of two, and then the degree of freedom of the error would be eight. So I think that would be my P and my F and my Q, but I'm not confident. Meredith? For two keys? Yeah, or for two key. For a three factor? Yeah. Um, I do not know. Let's see. What did I say down here? Sorry about the scrolling. I actually hate the scrolling thing. That's like my least favorite thing. <laughs> when you wrote this, did you mean, what did you mean by that? Like, cause in Tukey we can compare like multiple treatments, right? Did you mean like the number of treatments in the design or the number of treatments you're comparing? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you wrote this portion right here, mm -hmm. do you know if A, like for this particular example, was the number of treatments that you were comparing or the number of treatments in the design? In the design. In the design, okay. Hmm, okay. And then what would be B? B would be the number of blocks. Blocks, okay. Yeah, so that would be a blocks, okay. All right. I have a question and then I gotta go. Okay. Um, do we have like uh, the model parameters for factorial? We don't, I don't think we're gonna need them because we do have them, but we never ever talked about it ever. Like ever. Okay. It's different. Like it's in the lecture notes? It's not in the lecture notes. It is not in, the, um, not in any section notes and it's never been on a homework. And what it actually is, and I'll just show you right now. Sorry about the scrolling. Here we go. To the K factorial design. It's the beta times X1 plus beta times X2 plus beta three times X1, X2, like off the top of my head. And we've never gone over that in any of them. And it's actually because we are doing a least squares estimation of the model rather than doing its treatment like estimation. So that's that's actually why. I'm just gonna scroll to that and let you know. right okay. here. See, this is actually the, the portion in terms of a regression model. And up until now, what we were doing when we were getting the model like Y, I, J, K, that was actually the effects model, okay? And so, mm -hmm we are not really doing that. <laughs> and that's what I mean is like, this is this is your two to the two factorial design model. But I can't imagine they're gonna ask us that if they've never actually, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. And then I remember in lecture that one day where he was like, oh, this would take a really long time for me to do. So I'm not gonna do it. Uh, and this girl was like, can you though? And he was like, no. Uh, what was that? Do you remember that? Do you know which lecture? Um, let me see if I can pull it up. Do you remember that day though? No, I don't. Where, but before the pink scaling one, the one which he told us to do that. The one which you've been asking to you all the time. If anyone did that. 
I don't remember that. It was like before the Thanksgiving, uh, where he told us to do that for the remaining one. Is it the thing that he told us to do it for homework? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. yeah it's the um, it's the thing that I asked you guys about for the model parameters with the um, was it three factor design? Three factor design, estimating model parameters. It's this, right? Yeah, I think I have that one. Oh, you do? You really found it? I found it in the book. Oh, wow. I, I texted it to you, Gia. Okay, cool. I'll write it down right now since you texted it to me. Sorry, I haven't been checking my text messages. I see I missed like a zillion texts during this whole thing. Um, okay. All right. Let me. Holy crap! Yeah, it's 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 all here. Jenny saved the day. I'm gonna write it down right now in case anybody wants to get it before they leave. Thanks, Jenny. Of course. Thank you. All right, I think I got that right, right? Let's double check it. Yij dot dot, yi dot k dot, plus y dot j dot dot, plus yi. Oops, plus y. Nope, I think I didn't get that right. I dot k. I was way more than that. J dot dot. I think I'm missing plus y, i, dot, dot. Um, plus y, dot, k, dot, y. There's dot supposed to be eight there, and I think you only have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. y, i, j, k, dot, y, i, j, dot, dot, minus y, i, dot, k, dot. What are plus signs all this? Y dot J K. <laughs> y dot J K. Yeah, I know. I was a little I thrown off by that. Minus, minus. Okay. And this one got to be a minus. Excellent. All right. And E I J K L, which Wait. is just equal to Y. Um, J K L minus Y I J K, which is also equal to lowercase e I J K L. Okay. Awesome. Are all of these in the textbook? I believe that's where I. Let me double check and I'll tell you what page we're on. After I had that freak out yesterday, I went searching for all of that. <laughs> what else did you find? Gimme. Um, I like the peer estimate, the peer is SE equals the square root of sum of squares error divided by the def, uh, degree of freedom error for factorial designs. Yeah, we got that one. Okay. That's here in the factorial designs. Oh, there's like a huge lag on the screen. I just looked up and I saw that. All right. Uh, let's see, where is it? No. Correct this is what mm. Correct this. Correct this. Find your statistics. 
Just don't have right? Um, now there was a question in our homework that asked us about the pure error, and it's just your MSE, but it's the square root of your MSE. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what the answer was on the midterm for number two, two I or two, 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 two I? For question two, part I, I, sorry. Apparently I'm trying to figure out where the hell my damn midterm is. I'm gonna go now, guys. Thank you so Hi. much. You're welcome. Good luck in the final. Yeah, you too. Yeah, good luck. Bye bye. Bye. Hello. Hello. Oh, sorry, okay. my wife was just acting weird. I, I could not hear what we were like not talking or talking. I did not know. Hey, Shravan, why do you have your Shravan? Why do you have your hand raised? Oh, I had it raised from like a long time ago because I wanted to say someone was in the waiting room, and then, <laughs> uh, yeah. I was looking down this whole time. <laughs> Okay. So, so actually, the um, the estimate of that uh -huh. of the that of that parameter is actually in the handout that he gave us. Oh, uh, because it all it all um, corresponds to the sum of squares. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at it, there actually are pluses in it. Okay. So there are pluses in it. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to study that damn handout because <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm following what's happening. It was the two handouts for the the three factorial thing. And oh, I see. Okay. It's alpha beta row. Okay. But did you ever find your midterm? No. Oh, my my study area is a little all over the place. It's small. Okay, it's all good. No problem. I'm getting there, so but, hopefully. Yeah, I'm gonna look. Which homework was the one that had the pure error in it? Uh, pure error. Let me see. Definitely not in homework too. Oh, there's my midterm. Okay. And then pure error. Was that this? Oh, wait, no. There's no one's on this one. Oh, it's um, homework 5.5C. Homework 5.5C. Five, 5 yeah. Okay. Question two point, which one? Um, question two point II. Did you get the Sigma hat estimate? Model and universe involved. I don't believe I got that one. Okay. Hats I, I mean, I'm not completely correct anyway. Okay. 
It seems like I'm missing the sigma square hat, and I believe the correct answer is supposed to be just your MSC. Yeah, I believe that is supposed to be MSC. Okay. All right. So I will. All right, cool. So does anybody have any more questions or want to go over anything else? Um, I wanted to ask what the uh, multiple comparisons thing was in, in lecture, I think it's 13. Uh, I was just scrolling through and I I think it just talks about like the Fisher LSD and Tukey for uh, um, Bill. And but above that it says that um, beta J minus beta J um, prime. Yeah. Like something separated by, um, like, I just wanted to know as to whether or not that was like another model parameter we had to estimate, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this has to do with its model and its model parameters, yeah, because beta j's are the vector that describe the model and their coefficients of an x1 and x2 describe the two factors. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know, do we need this? Jesus Christ. But this is actually relevant to your H2 in this example, which is, uh, okay. Sorry, what was the question again? Um, I guess I just wanted to know if that was something that I had to worry about, I guess. I'm, I'm just going to focus on other stuff, honestly. Like, yeah, I, I mean, uh, so, like, to go over. I hope not. Well, I mean, if in case we need it, it's in uh, lecture 13. Yeah. This is interesting. Like, I actually don't know this one. Well, oh, well. I think I've reached my maximum ability to to regurgitate information. Like I don't think I know anything more at this point. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> like I think I try my best, but I'm like, well, I'm tapped out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after you can only do like a confidence interval, I think, if it's rejected, and you're basically using the confidence interval to say like. Um, what is it? What is it? 95% confidence interval that it would fall within, uh, that the effect, I guess maybe it's the effect that they're estimating. Yeah, I don't know. I also don't understand why they use a plus and minus for Tukey. That's weird. Mm -hmm. Wait, for the confidence interval? No, like in this particular lecture, when what he's talking about in the lecture 13, like midway through this lecture, Dr. J is like the confidence interval is plus and minus T one minus alpha over two comma F. But then like after that, he starts talking about two E it's like, use when you want to compare any pair, not just a particular pair. And then he says for this, it's like plus or minus Q, one minus alpha, T, F. And I'm like, that's weird. So that's, that's the part where you're, all, you're only doing Bs if you're, if you're comparing the Bs. Like if you're comparing A, then you're comparing A and then the error. Yeah. But I don't know why he changed it to SE instead of just keeping all the MS E divided by AN, though. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This is the part I actually don't understand, the two key stuff. But I'm just going to say that it's worth not enough points for me to like continue to like freak out yeah. about it. I'm going to like, look it up, but I don't know what i'm not sure what will come of it i actually feel like i need to drill problems at this point and not like 
worry too much about having my notes. Yes, yeah, it's kind of what I've been doing. I've been like making notes and then doing the homework and then adding things to the notes as I'm doing the homework going, oh, I forgot this. Yeah. So yeah. I think, oh, Erica just emailed us. Hold on one second. So the model for the two factorial design is not something we have to worry about. But That's correct. As uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we won't have a two factorial problem. It's just the model that we don't have to stress about. Yeah. Yeah. The model and the model parameters. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great news. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's exactly, yeah, that's freaking great. All right. All right, guys. Any other questions before I sign off? I think I'm good. Uh, oh, uh, actually, do you think you could directed version of the uh, RMD file? Yeah, I'll do that and I'll send it out to everybody. Um, Thank you so much. I didn't get the original file. We can make correct. sure that I'm in there. Yes, I will definitely do that. <laughs> I guess I'm not in the group chat you guys have been using. <laughs> but yes, we made a new group chat for the um, study session yesterday. And then I've just continued to like use that one because I just everything is too much right now. I'm like not it's, as good. It's all good. It's all good. Thanks for texting me though. Um, oh, I did actually have one other question on homework. Uh, I, I'm losing my mind. 5.8. For some reason, I will total up like the yi dot dot and the y dot j dot dot. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, when I'm putting it in the ANOVA table and I'm checking it against what I have, mm -hmm. like my SSA is actually my SSB. So I don't, I'm not understanding, like, does it oh. matter which, like if oh. A is your feed rate or if depth oh. of cut is your feed rate? No, um, it does not matter. You can assign either to be A or B. But you okay. have to put, you, so when you do your final, like don't just write, oh, it's a row. So I'm just gonna use A and expect the grader to know what the hell you're talking about. You have Oh to. no, no, no. Definitely have to put like feed rate or depth yeah. of cut or yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. Not for interaction, you can just write interaction, right? Yeah. Okay. Or A B. Okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I Probably I write both. That way it keeps it very clear. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I've been confused on so far. Once I figured out the model parameters, it was, I was home free. <laughs> all right, was, guys. Um, thank you again. Really appreciate yeah. you guys showing this up. No problem. All right. Have a good night. I'll put this on YouTube and I'll like text everybody. Sure. All right. Awesome. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.